Hello, everybody. Welcome to Taco Tuesday. I'm Troy Anderson from Repair Shopper. I founded Repair Shopper after running a computer repair shop for about 10 years and getting sick of the software, like not being all integrated. Um, today, I've got Cole Thornton from Gadget Grave with us. Cool. Cole, you're listed as the co-founder. Um, can you do a quick, you know, 30-second bio and tell us what you do there and um, what your background is? Yeah, absolutely. I went to school to be a registered nurse, and I nursed for about five years working in an ER and a surgery type setting. Uh, during that time, I was kind of in charge of the technology for the uh, physicians that I worked with, and so um, they gave me a lot of free time. And that's when I started up Gadget Grave with my co-founder Aaron Price, and he's kind of the the repair expert, and he just kind of has things figured out. And I was kind of more in charge of the marketing and advertising and some of the growth. And so seven seven years later, we're uh, here we've got a location in Fort Smith and in Fayetteville and should uh, have one open in Bentonville, Arkansas in the next uh, three months. So I'm trying to grow right now. Awesome. Cool. <clears throat> and um, this is Taco Tuesday, so let's get the uh, let's get the unveiling going. I went to a local spot called Tacos Chukis in Seattle on Capitol Hill. This is like a hipster taco place. Uh, what you got there? I've got a Doritos Locos taco. Uh, <laughs> Just because I thought I'd give it a shot. And then I've got a soft taco over here, fresco style, because I'm trying to watch my figure. Nice. <laughs> and you did uh, Taco Bell. Taco Bell, yeah. I'm, I've kind of got limited choices here in Fort Smith, Arkansas, on a good taco joint. So that might be another venture for another day is getting a good Thank taco place here. Drive an hour or two for the next one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. So um, I've got half, like, house taco, which is a marinated pork and pineapple and stuff, and half steaks. So this should be exciting. This is um, yeah, it looks good. The place I went to, I was introduced to by the founder of Urban Spoon. I was working there, and I kept talking to him about his cool car. He's got a Tesla. And then he's like, hey, you want to drive it? And he took me to this place and let me drive it up there. So that's that's my origin story for this taco joint. So, uh, yeah, fun tidbit. Did you ever use Urban Spoon back in the day? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, did they sell out to Zomato? They did. Um, yeah, I, I stopped using them at that point. Like, I gave up on the company. But before that, Urban Spoon was the jam. Yeah, yeah. Cool reputation. Uh, a lot of cool stuff happened there. But, yeah, you know, business. I now use uh, TripAdvisor. What is your go-to uh, app if you're in a new city? Uh, I'm actually using Yelp. Yelp. Oh, man. Ugh. I'm I'm not, I tried Google. I did, um, but... As a retail business owner, I have mixed mixed feelings with Yelp. Uh, I kind of have mixed reviews, too, and I think I could pay to get some of them cleaned up. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Uh, in my shop, I was a paying advertiser on Yelp, and I never had – let's see here. So a lot of people talk about the whole, like, extortion thing. I'm not going to – I, I kind of think um, what happened with me was I did ask a lot of people for reviews, so I had a lot of my reviews were, like, first-time reviewers. And then those were all buried. And I think that's probably valid. That's like what's supposed to happen. Um, and over the years of continually just having everybody review, I think I just started to get some more like actual users hitting it up. And then some of those did stick. So um, I think we were barely net positive on the 600 bucks a month we were spending for our shop. But I definitely hear from a lot of people that don't feel like they get anything out of it. But um, definitely got to track that stuff so you know if those leads are actually coming. What was, what was your experience with Yelp? I advertised for about six months. I didn't see much, but they, they, the issue they have is in my area, they just said they didn't have enough searches to really warrant me being a paying customer. So when I opened my second store, they had me you know, advertise in both areas and split the cost amongst one $600 a month payment. And so um, I really didn't feel like the customer acquisition costs were probably in the 20, 20s range. And I feel like um, PPC with Google is somewhere much closer to like 250 or three bucks. Um, wow. Yeah, so I, I didn't feel like it was beneficial. I've got five positive reviews on, on Yelp. I think I've got one, one or two negative, and then I've got 22 that are hidden. Uh, and I think all the ones that are hidden are five star. But anytime they call me now, like I don't want to piss anybody off at Yelp, so I just tell them I'm broke and I can't advertise with them right now. Call me back in six months. So we'll see. And so far, they've done a pretty good job. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, don't don't let me keep you talking the whole time. Dig into your tacos there. Yeah, um, absolutely. I don't have any napkins, so I have shop towels. Smart. This should be our screen refurbishing room, and um, 
we have kind of a ghetto clean room that we made. Looks clean to me. Yeah, clean-ish. Um, we really had a lot of trouble with dust, and so we, we kind of put that project on hold. And now we're having a, another company do our screen refurbs for us for a good enough price. I can't beat it. Cool. Yeah. So you were telling me you're in your warehouse. You guys have a couple stores. Can you give me a little background of your like setup? How do you guys operate? Well, we have a warehouse and stores and stuff. The the thought process has been we opened Fort Smith, I guess, seven years ago, and then Fayetteville um, right at two years ago. And so um, just moved into the warehouse about a year ago. And what we've been working on is trying to transition to the warehouse being the supplier, um, you know, head of the logistics. We kind of ran into a couple hiccups because we don't have a full-time employee here at the warehouse. So um, myself or Alex or Aaron will come over here and we'll fill orders and do some of that stuff. But this is also where we run gizmostock.com. And so um, I've got a guy doing that and some of our eBay sales. So it's kind of nice and quiet to be able to get away and come over here versus the busy, you know, hustle and bustle of the stores. Our Fort Smith store has, uh, I guess, at any given time, about 10, lo 10 employees uh, working. And then my Fayetteville store usually has between four and five. So it's just crazy. Every time I sit down, I can't really stop because I'm constantly getting interrupted. That sounds busy with 10 employees per store. And uh, my understanding is you guys are doing mostly mobile device stuff, but um, with 10 employees in a shop, is that just like, Broken screens coming in nonstop, or are you guys doing all kinds of other stuff there? It's big retail. What's what do your stores look like? Yeah, I would say thirty percent of our thirty thirty three percent of our business it comes from like device sales, and so those are my favorite types of sales. The easiest oh. money customer comes in and leaves. We offer a six month warranty, and we try to stock at any given time at each location about seventy five to hundred phones, maybe eight to ten computers, and then usually between fifteen and thirty tablets, depending what what's available. Are those new or refurbished? 90% new are uh, used or refurbished. Um, I do have a couple suppliers on new and box stuff, but generally the pr margins that I get on those don't necessarily warrant me spending $10,000 to make 10,500. Totally. Yeah. 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 So I, I try to avoid that. Um, and I don't have a lot of customers coming to me to buy a brand new pebble watch or an LG you know, watch. I, I don't see a lot of that. So a lot of that stuff just kind of, if I buy it new from a customer, I'll just turn around and try to sell it on eBay and sell it there as quickly as possible. So our eBay store just hit 8,000 feedback last week. And so that's exciting. Wow. Some of our online e-commerce, um, hopefully. But um, yeah, so uh, it, you know, everybody's kind of constantly doing um, testing devices. I'm constantly getting new devices in. I would say a third of our business is repair. And so I've got four cell phone and tablet technicians. I've got two computer techs, uh, and they're always con you know pretty much constantly busy. There's never much downtime. But a lot of that might be counting screens for RMA or you know doing other things besides strictly repair. Then our Fayetteville store doesn't operate like that. They've got four employees, usually two up front and two in the back. Um, one, of the person, one of the people in the back would be a manager, and the other one would be a technician. And so our technicians generally don't have a lot of interaction with the customers in store. They do on the phone if they have any questions or when the device is repaired. Okay. It's worked for us. How did you do it in your store? Did you, were you just a one-man shop where they came in and talked to you, or did you have sales associates? Um, good question. So I started out in my van, one-man show got um, commercial space with my now wife, did that, still one man, and then um, we got a retail store, we bought like a print shop and did half mailboxes, copy and print, and computer repair, <laughs> put the computer repair in the back, and then had employees there. And then from there, like a couple other stores doing computer repair, didn't have a warehouse, just had a couple people at each place, taking computers in, fixing computers, doing that thing. Um, so kind of from that point, maybe 2006, um, really focused on making the business like run without me being there. So the people working at the store had to be able to do everything. And I would just kind of check on them and stuff. Um, do you ever miss it? Uh, not The multiple store thing was killer. That broke me, like two of the stores didn't make money, had to close them pretty soon. One of the stores worked well, but um, that wasn't for me. And then, you know, my wife kind of made me go to a, like a meetup group on Learn to Program, and that's kind of where Repair Shopper came from. And I've always thought of myself as like an inventor, kind of builder, kind of hacker guy. And um, I just, I like building software because I can pretty quickly with modern tools, like make an app that does something. Um, I just, 
yeah, gets my creative side fulfilled. Um, so I'm definitely having more fun doing software development than I did like interfacing with actual customers. But there's definitely people that enjoy talking to customers all day. Um, it may be kind of a weird question, and maybe, I mean, I, feel free to cut it if you need to, but um, what would you say attribute the failure to those stores? Um, I probably needed to watch your, like, panel talk at CPA before I did it. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't know what I was doing in retail. I just, like, hey, I, like, eat teriyaki at this retail place all the time, so I know about retail. Like, yeah. it doesn't work like that. So... Um, I think I opened up in subpar locations and then didn't have any clue how to do advertising, kind of just hoped Google search would take care of it. And we had really good Google rankings, but we just didn't have enough business. I think, you know, the place didn't look beautiful like a lot of stores I'm seeing out there on social media. Like when I see our users posting pictures of their stores, I've never looked that good. And then we never got enough foot traffic really going. Um, so I think I failed in location and advertising and what do you call the look and feel of the actual store? Um, kind of a cosmetic, yeah. I think combination of the three, like if you nail those, location, look, and advertising, like you're fine. And I think I probably missed pretty bad on all of them. <laughs> one of the stores just kept growing and growing and growing and worked out and we were, you know, that location, I was still there. The guy would sold it to um, so. One of my favorite books is The E-Myth um, uh, by Michael Gerber, and it kind of talks about either working on the business or working for the business. And it seems like the first couple, three years that I was working with Gadget Grave, or, you know, from the start that we, from the time that we uh, started the company until probably three years in, I was so busy being a sales associate or a brand representative or, you know, whatever it was that, I, we didn't really focus on growth the way that we, we should have. We thought we were, but looking back at it, we just were clueless. Um, and so we made a lot of mistakes. Um, I don't know if I told you, but we started a software company to have a, a CRM. We called it Repair CRM. We had the repaircrm.com. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I, we got an investor on board. We raised uh, $50,000 of um, capital, and then we matched. We added about 35000 personally. And... Um, got pretty far. I mean, we got to a, a version one with had a, a point of sale that was kind of just all done in JavaScript and uh, it was clunky and uh, done in Zend framework. Zend one actually and Zend two had just came out and our Ukrainian developers just kind of robbed us. I mean, ultimately. Um, what? Yeah, we never really had a finalized product. They wanted another 20,000 when we were already 25,000 over budget. Um, we weren't asking for changes. They weren't hitting deadlines. Uh, it was just broken promises and a bad development and you know, I didn't necessarily know how to run a, uh, a software development project very well. So this is a good story. So who has that domain? No, uh, we let it lapse. Oh. Repair CRM. What? It means nothing to me now. I will never, ever revive that project. I will. I own buymyphone.com at one point, too. And building back the buyback site for um, the buyback process, I'm just not a good software developer, project leader when it comes to that type of thing. My business partner is. We just found a good developer. I learned a lot from outsourcing. Uh, man, I've probably hired a couple hundred people over the last 10 years for different like pet projects, side projects, and then you know a bunch of different helpers on different aspects of Repair Shopper. Um, but yeah, you can, you can hire 20 people and have 20 bad experiences and then find a really good one that you keep for years. Um, it, it's, yeah, we never found the good ones through and it can be expensive and you got to be ready to just hire a bunch of people that you just don't um, get great results with for whatever reason. What's your cheapest uh, overseas employee ever been? Oh, uh, four bucks an hour. We had a dollar and 11 cents an hour, a uh, girl from Indonesia doing data mining and finding uh, uh, customers, you know, names and e email addresses and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's just dollar eleven cents, and I think odesk.com took eleven cents of that. So she was working for a dollar an hour. It's amazing, and she was probably really happy. Yeah, she, and she was mediocre, and she probably did an hour, maybe maybe about four dollars an hour work. You know, sure. Looking back at it, but yeah, no problem, man. How are your tacos? Oh, awesome! I'm happy. You said you got different flavors, steak, and what was the other one? Marinated pork with pineapple. That one's really good, and then. Regular steak. Are you jealous that I got nacho cheese Doritos Locos? 
I was at a Taco Bell and got one of those little griller things a couple weeks ago. I was so happy with that thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's definitely a different experience than a real taco from like a Mexican joint. Uh, but man, they just concoct the perfect flavor in a lab and it works. <laughs> Taco Bell is so good at creating new menu items that do not require any new ingredients. Yeah. So, you know, and it's amazing uh, because they'll come up with a tostada and then a grilled, lo you know, loaded griller and they're not having to make anything additional. They just have this huge menu that they'll do anything. And if you like something that you had seven years ago that hadn't been on the menu in seven years, there's a good chance they'll still do it for you. Not bad. There's a guy locally that I actually went and met with. He actually uh, is the largest single owner of uh, Taco Bell uh, franchises in the U.S. He's got like 395 locations. He's also got something like 115 KFCs and like 25 or maybe it was 10 Golden Corrals. Um, but the guy's a baller. He's doing really, really well. Uh, and he started here in Fort Smith whenever, like 1972 or 74 working for KFC as a, a dishwasher. And then just kind of has grown this huge, huge empire and uh you know the, the amount of money they're doing is just obscene yeah those those stores do a pretty good monthly clip uh it's not anything like your little neighborhood computer repair shop yeah yeah i don't know how to change that i don't know how we become a big major player you know but i don't know if i want to compete with best buy but i've got used devices and no one else in the market really does so how can i capitalize on that and what i found is nobody really googles where to buy a, a used phone they just know to go to ebay or go to amazon or and maybe Craigslist. They just walk into the Verizon store and they're like, help. And yeah. yeah. And, I, and I tell you how I win those guys over. I take them donuts and business cards and do it once a month. I've done it for seven years now. I go to all the AT&Ts and Verizon, Sprints, T-Mobiles. And it's one of those things that I do personally. And I shake hands and I introduce and I, I kind of enjoy it. I hear about people saying to do this. And I believe someone hears this and maybe tries it once and then stops. But you no. actually really do it yourself every month. Yeah. I enjoy it. I throw on an audio book and I drive for seven hours in a car all day and I don't answer any store phone calls. I don't talk to any of my employees unless it's an emergency. And uh, I go, I go for about a 45 mile radius. No. Yeah. About a, uh, I'm sorry, 60 mile radius of Fort Smith just cause I don't have a lot of competition. There's a lot of smaller rural cities that don't have a corporate AT&T, but they've got like a, a Russell cellular Verizon or an apex AT&T wireless, you know, authorized retailer. Yep. So uh, I just take them stacks of cards and, and donuts and I, do it every, I've done it every month. I mean, I don't miss. And uh, so I go in and they all know me by name and they all call and you know, we'll ask the store uh, repair prices and send customers to us daily. Um, so it's like $250 a month and worth every penny. So my store would get maybe a referral a week from, an, from a random store like that, but we never kept it up and we never really targeted it. So my computer repair shop, I had a copier guy that was super busy that I made really good friends with, and he was a, he was the best referral source we ever had. And I imagine what you're describing, it can work the same way with these stores, but um, building those relationships can be hard. So that's the secret. Donuts every month. Bribe them. Bribery. That is you the secret. Are, and you guys you know, are, I, the way I see it is with a box of donuts, a dozen donuts, that buys me at least a 30-second elevator pitch. And anyone will hear 30 seconds. So you just kind of got to be clear and concise and let them know that, you know, what you offer, what your services are, a lot of them will come back and ask what a pri for a price list. And my response to that is our prices are always changing, but if you give us a call, we can give you a price on the spot real quick and easy. And then I also tell them that I love their problem customers. If they've got a real jerk, send them to us. We love the jerks because we always turn them around and make them happy. Because they're not mad at us. They're mad at AT&T and we can relate. And I can say, yeah, at and is a jerk. Give us money. We'll fix your problems. You know? Yeah, this is a good tip. Yeah, oh, I've been doing it for seven years, man, and I tell you, I, my co competition passes out bottles of water, and, um, you know, they, they've got uh, multiple locations, they're a bigger chain, and uh, I go in with donuts, and everybody just kind of shakes their head and is like, yeah, this is so much better than bottled water. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I've, I've taken chocolate-covered strawberries, I've done pizza parties, I've done some of that stuff, too, for some of the bigger, uh, higher referring companies. Donuts is where it's at. If you send me donuts, I'll give you 15 minutes. No, nope. yeah, dude, that's it. I'm <laughs> if you bring me tacos, I'll give you 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, dude, absolutely. Where's Robert at today? He's doing CEO stuff. Ah, okay. I guess he <laughs> does. He do any programming? No. Uh, he knows SQL pretty well. Yeah, but no, he's not actually usually working on the product. Yeah. Um, How many developers do you guys have? How many what? You guys have six developers. Yeah. Full time. And then how many part-time people do you think at any given time? Well, it's like. 
three full time and then a couple full time contractors and a part time contractor here or there. Are you tired of all of Gadget Graves uh, employees' feedback? I actually wanted to bring up your employees. So, um, yeah, you guys give great feedback. But I want to hear how do you guys hire such great people? I keep interacting with your people, and I was telling our team this in like an all hands meeting like, hey, this is these people we met at CTIA and their employees are like checking us out. They're about to switch over. And every time I talk to one of their people, they're like the most friendly, polite people I've ever talked to. Everyone's like exclamations. Yeah, thank you. Like <laughs> everyone's super happy. And it's the same on, on the calls I've had with a couple people. How do you find, how do you filter for personality? Like how do you, how do you think about hiring and, yeah, tell us tell us your philosophies around like how how you do that. We we've kind of I, I would say I, I hate to use the word perfect because I think there's always room for improvement, but we've got a really interesting way that we go about it. And so um, there's job sites like Indeed and Monster and some of these. And so um, Monster is a pay service. Indeed is free. And so we post on Indeed and we kind of post a pretty long description of what the job is. And and that's actually uh, if you uh, have a chance or are interested, you can go to Indeed.com and search for Bentonville, Arkansas, Gadget Grave, and you'll see one of our listings we're currently hiring for that, you know, sales position. And so um, between whenever we post that, we usually post it several weeks in advance and we usually get anywhere from 20 to 50 applicants. We go through and I quickly scan the resume. And if I see a lot of misspellings or a lot of bad typing or poorly formatted or just somebody that doesn't know technology and it's obvious just in the resume, I instantly set up um, a rejection letter. That's a canned response. Thank you for trying. We'll save your resume. Um, you know, we'll keep you in mind. Not, not a good fit basically. And then, um, if, if I like the resume, I send a canned response that is, hey, you made it to round two out of 50 applicants. You're one of 10 that we've selected to do a follow-up. Please answer these five questions. And the questions are like, you know, what is your typing speed per, you know, per minute, you know, WPM? What is your, um, you know, when, explain a situation where you've had to make a customer happy that was upset. And some of these open-ended type questions that make sure that they're going to qualify for a phone interview. So the next step would be to call them and say, you know, talk to either myself or one of the other hiring managers. Go ahead. How many from that first <clears throat> where you select your 10 of 50 and you email them back, how many of those are good enough to pass? Is there always one or are there times when you have to keep doing this a few times to get one of those to pass? Yeah, there, there absolutely are. I, my, my goal is to disqualify as many candidates as possible without wasting my time because my time's valuable. I don't want to read everybody's resume. If I notice you know, off the bat that it's way out there, I just instantly reject. And so I can go through 50, 50 resumes and I don't know, probably 30 minutes uh, and pay, paying attention to the ones that I think make sense. Uh, and then I look for job history, making sure they've not jump, bounced around to 10 different jobs. I like seeing people that have a job history of staying at places for two to three years with multiple job situations. I also disqualify anybody that's in college. I can't work around college schedules. I'm not interested. They can come to you when they're out of college, you know. Uh, there's enough people out there. So uh, I've not ran into a situation where I had to hire, you know, someone in college because um, every time I have, it's been a nightmare, I guess. Every time, you know, whatever. So is there a time when you reject all 50 and you just do it again the next week? Yeah, and I don't know if we always get 50. Um, and it, really, I just kind of leave the job up and I'll just go check Indeed about every two weeks and see that I've got 17 new candidates. Okay. So then I'll go and reject the new candidates and set up interviews and kind of go from there. And so um, out of the, I think the 98 that we got, we've hired two. Um, over the last couple weeks. And so uh, once we do the phone interview like them, we set up an in-person interview. So it sounds like it's a lot of steps, but really, again, I don't want to waste someone's time coming to talk to me for 20 minutes only to realize they're not at all a right fit. So between the phone interview and the in-person interview, we also creep their social, make sure they're not a weirdo, make sure they're not taking weird pictures, doing weird stuff, uh, <laughs> just to make sure that they're somebody that fits. And then I uh, do the in-person interview, and usually that's done with um, either an owner and the hiring manager or um, you know, maybe a couple people that if it's, if they're going to be, want to be a technician, we'd have a lead technician there to be able to ask some harder questions that kind of relate. Um, but then, yeah, if they're, if they're a good fit, we get them onboarding information. We've got a, an internal wiki that we use with actually a repair shopper. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to check that out. It's, we're, we're trying to beef it up. Yeah. And so uh, we print off some of those documents and uh, send them home with that after the first interview, after we you know, give them the job and say, before you come on the first day, you need to know this information. And so when they get there on day one, they've got terminology, they know our address, they know our phone number, they know all the stuff that I'm not having to waste my time with one employee or one of my, you know, my time sitting down with this guy saying, this is what you need to know. Um, so we're also working on testing. We've got an entry exam, then we've got a tier one and tier two exam. So once someone is competent in making work orders and able to discuss, you know, uh, 
talk to customers on the phone. That's one, you know, for tier one. Uh, know how, how to answer, know our core values. We've got seven core values that we stand by. And so we're really trying to get in a situation where we're going to have all of the information ready to go. So once we start franchising, which is hopefully going to be in the next six months, I can hand someone kind of a turnkey, be a huge resource for any information they, they might need. Um, but that wiki is really helping out a lot. So from your phone interview and your in-person, are you able to find out if they've got a great personality and are really friendly? Or, you know, a lot of times when you're interviewing someone, they're going to put their best face on and it might be hard to get to the real personality. How do you find someone that's like genuinely really friendly? I try to, I try to make the interview as, um, the, as less tense as possible. I, I, I try to go in and I ask them, you know, have you ever played any video games? You know, what kind of video games are you into? Because I like, I like I game some. I don't, I, not a whole lot anymore just because I've got kids and family. But I, it seems like the people that have gamed in the past have a good enough understanding of computers in general to be able to learn any CRM. If they played StarCraft or Diablo or any of these, you know, Half-Life 2, Counter-Strike, whatever, I, you know, I can relate to some of these people. So that's, a, that's one thing that I like the gamers. Now, I have had to fire some of them because they stay up every night till three or four in the morning and show up at nine just, you know, dragging ass and looking terrible. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, uh, if they don't fit, I usually know within two weeks, and we let them go. I don't feel bad firing people. You know, I used to. I used to break my heart. Um, but now it's like I don't want to waste their time. They don't need to waste my time. Cut the losses as quick as possible. Cut your fat. Um, you know, we made the mistake. One of my interview questions is always, what kind of phone do you use? And then I kind of like to talk to them about it. Do you play any games? What apps do you have? Blah. And uh, this girl, I didn't ask her that question. And so she started and she had a slider phone. Uh, not, not interested in, in smartphones at all. And so she lasted a week. And I just said, look, if you're not interested, I'm not interested. Have a nice day. Uh, huh. yeah, cut your fat quick. If you don't get along with someone, there's no reason to work with them 40 hours a week. You know, I don't enjoy that. How do you balance... Like if you hire him away from another job, you still gonna you just tell yeah. him, hey, in the first two weeks, like this is a trial period. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a probationary period. That's when they have to learn uh, the information to be a tier one. They need to be a tier one employee by two weeks, and that means they can handle a register on their own. Maybe not open and close it, but definitely be able to take cash transactions, be able to process customers' work orders, know where to go find devices, um, know how to use repair shopper and find customer data. That's tier one. I don't want someone talking to a customer um, that has no clue about our business and our core values. Uh, they just sit there and they're supposed to be quiet while they're training. You know, they're not really supposed to interact with customers other than saying, hey, I'll be right with you. I'm training. Let's let so-and-so take care of you. Cool. That's good. So stuff. it's kind of a process. Um, you know, they're, they're, I feel like right now, specifically, I've got the best crew I've ever had. Um, I've had guys that have stolen. I've had guys that have had to, you know, fire because they lied or, uh, you know, that type of stuff. And um, I feel like right now everybody's really strong. That's good. So you, you kind of walked into that. You know, you're lucky. All the guys there right now are great. And girl. Yeah, that's great. So um, at CTA, we met you at CTA. You, you were on a panel that I unfortunately missed. I was wondering if, did that panel happen? Can you talk about that? Like how, how'd that go? Um, yeah, it was fantastic. Um, Michelle James and uh, Jeremy Wells helped put it on. And um, the other panelists were all industry experts. There was someone there from Voicecom, someone else there that had multiple, I guess, nine locations. Um, and someone that kind of focused on retail space uh, growth and, and I think uh, build out and feng shui kind of was his specialty you know, the layout of the store to make sure it maximize sales. Um, and so it was awesome. Sorry. What, was the, what was the topic? What was it about? Um, basically, maximizing sales, increasing uh, dollars, increasing customers. Um, so, you know, increasing customer ticket transactions. So if a customer normally would come in and spend 70 bucks, well, let's sell them a case and a tempered glass and make sure they get a car charger as well. Um, and so kind of adding uh, ticket value, but it kind of went all over the place. Um, you know, there's a lot of crowd participation where they asked a lot of questions too. And so uh, it was a lot of fun, man. I don't like public speaking much. It's tough, me neither, but I can probably sit up on a stage and be questioned. Yeah, and that was it. And I was with the three, three other, you know, people that I would consider experts that were fantastic. So that helped out a lot. I think if I just had to speak for an hour and give a keynote, I think I would probably have a lot of trouble. I think you could do it. <laughs> yeah. I probably need to just work on it some, but I'm on a non 
profit uh, for a music festival called the Peacemaker Music and Arts Festival. It's peacemakerfest.com. And so there's uh, four of us that kind of started it, and we've already gone through two, two years now. Um, and so it's, uh, it, it's been a, a lot of fun, too. It's kind of something that I, I enjoy also doing besides Gadget Grave. It's kind of helping with that nonprofit and growing it and bringing people to Fort Smith, Arkansas. So last year we had about 8,000 people uh, show up, and so it was a good event. So do you get up on stage and speak at your music festival? Yeah. Yeah, I had to do radio, had to do news, had to do a couple different, you know, getting up uh, um, at another event and talking about it. I was on a panel uh, as well. So it kind of forced me to do some public speaking. And so this last year, I've had more public speaking experience than ever, you know, besides oral comm in college, which I hated that class. <laughs> you know what? Okay, so work-life balance. You've got kids, you've got a business, you're running the business, you've got this nonprofit. How do you see... How much time does the business get? How much time does family get? How much time does nonprofit get? How does that work for you? Yeah, I, I'm finally at a point now, seven years in, where I'm able to take off Saturdays and Sundays. I'm able to leave most days by 5.30. Uh, this week it seems like closer to 6.30, but try to leave by 5.30 or 6 so I can go home and eat dinner with the family and give kids baths and uh, get them ready for bed. Um, but for the first, I guess it really depends where you're at in your business. For the first probably three years, I was putting in 65 and 70 hour weeks, always on call, um, I made the mistake of using my cell phone number online for the first two months of our business. Been and there. so, oh yeah, all the sites that scraped Yahoo, all the sites that scraped, you know, any of these business directories. I, I'm now on business directories still to this day that I can't reach them. They won't respond to emails and I can't get my number removed. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's the work-life balance is important. And I'm just now at a point in my life where I'm able to kind of shift some focus to family because I really felt like I was missing out. So I'm missing some games, missing some some of that stuff that I just have made it a promise to myself. I'm not going to miss any more of my kids' games. I will be at all of them, whatever it takes. Yeah, you know, that's. I think family is more important than business. Um, but I'm also in a situation where the business is, is able to continue and work. And if I'm gone, then I know that people are in place to take care of it. I imagine that you know if I had to go back to where it was when I started and it was me there all day, all night, closing, staying till 9 p.m., uh, if I had to do that again right now, I'd probably go crazy, you know? Yeah, I have a similar feeling. I think the first few years is tough to not work a ton. And then once you do get a balance, um, if I had to go do it all over again right now, I don't know if I could work 60, 70 hours a week. Um, do you have kids? A four-year-old, yeah. I remember you telling me that. Okay, awesome. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, my two-year-old sprained his ankle last week, so I've been dealing with that. Oh, fun. Yeah. Cool. Um, Cool. That's all I've got for today. Um, last closing question. What's your favorite feature or module in Repair Shopper? You know, what I love the most coming, you know, is the, the universal search. I love the fact that I can go up there and type an IMEI and see, you know, just about anything or type in a customer name and see kind of multiple instances of that and not have to go digging. So I love that just because it's quick and easy. Um, that's probably what I love most. Okay. You have any questions for me before we call it? Man, I don't. I don't. I uh, I definitely have really enjoyed working with you guys, and I appreciate you having me on uh, on the 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 pod. Is it a podcast or a vlog or what do you call them this? Sure. Just Taco Tuesday. This I is Taco Tuesday. This is a show. We, after we get a few episodes out, we can call it a podcast. But right awesome. now, it's a beta. <laughs> it's an awesome. Well, keep me posted, man. I enjoyed it. I'll be involved anytime I can. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Well, signing off. Thank you very much, Cole. Um, we'll see you later. Thanks, I'll see you, buddy. Have a good day.